ignore for a moment all the specific investments you've ever heard of. Having a basic grasp of the investment world is important, so I simplify it for you in the following sections. You have two major investment choices. You can be a lender or an owner. When you invest your money in a bank certificate of deposit, CD, a treasury bill, or a bond issued by a company, such as the energy giant ExxonMobil, for example, you're a lender. In each case, you lend your money to an organization, a bank, the federal government, or ExxonMobil. The organization pays you an agreed-upon rate of interest for lending your money and promises to return your original investment, the principal, on a specific date. Getting paid all the interest in addition to getting back your original investment, as promised, is your hoped-for outcome when you make a lending investment. Given that the investment landscape is littered with carcasses of failed investments, however, this result isn't guaranteed. When you invest in a newly issued bond, you lend your money to an organization. The bond includes a specified maturity date, the time at which the principal is repaid, and a particular interest rate, or what's known as a coupon. This rate is fixed on most bonds. So, for example, if you buy a 10-year, 5% bond issued by Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer, you're lending your money to Boeing for 10 years at an interest rate of 5% per year. Bond interest is usually paid in two equal semi-annual installments. Some types of bonds have higher yields than others, but the risk-reward relationship remains intact. A bond generally pays you a higher rate of interest when it has a lower credit rating to compensate for the higher risk of default and the higher likelihood of losing your investment, longer-term maturity, how many years until bondholders are paid back, to compensate for the risk that you'll be unhappy with the bond's set interest rate if the market level of interest rates moves up. A bond's value generally moves opposite of the directional change in interest rates. For example, if you're holding a bond issued at 5% and rates increase to 6% on comparable newly issued bonds, your bond decreases in value. Why would anyone want to buy your bond at the price you paid if it yields just 5% when 6% can be obtained elsewhere? Bonds differ from one another in the following major ways. The type of institution to which you lend your money. With municipal bonds, you lend your money to a state or local government or agency. With treasuries, you lend your money to the federal government. With corporate bonds, you lend your money to a corporation. The credit quality of the borrower to which you lend your money. Credit quality is a measurement of the likelihood that the borrower will default on the interest and principal you're owed. Knowing this information is important because higher credit rating bonds are generally safer but pay lower rates of interest. The length of the bond's maturity. Short-term bonds mature within 5 years, intermediate bonds mature within 5 to 10 years, and long-term bonds mature within 30 years. Longer-term bonds generally pay higher yields but fluctuate more with changes in interest rates. The bond's callability. Callability means that the bond's issuer can decide to pay you back earlier than the previously agreed-upon date. This event usually occurs when interest rates fall and the bond issuer wants to issue new, lower interest rate bonds to replace the higher rate bonds outstanding. To compensate you for early repayment, the bond's issuer typically gives you a small premium over what the bond is currently valued at. Many folks think that lending investments are safe and without risk, which is wrong. Lending money has the following disadvantages. You may not get what you're promised. When a company goes bankrupt, for example, you can lose all or part of your original investment. Your money's purchasing power may be reduced by inflation. Many folks have grown complacent with the low inflation the United States has enjoyed for quite some time. But what if inflation increases to 6% per year or even 10% per year as it last did in the early 1980s? After a decade of that much inflation, the purchasing power of your money drops 44% at 6% annual inflation and a whopping 61% at 10% yearly inflation. Also, the value of a bond may drop below what you paid for it if interest rates rise or the quality or risk of the issuing company declines. You don't share in the upside of the organization to which you lend your money. If a company grows in size and profits, your principal and interest rate don't grow along with it. They stay the same. Of course, such success should ensure that you get your promised interest in principle. The three best ways to build long-term wealth are to invest in ownership investments, stocks, real estate, and small business. Stocks, which represent shares of ownership in a company, are the most common ownership investment vehicle. 
You're an owner when you invest your money in an asset, such as a company or real estate, that has the ability to generate earnings or profits. Suppose that you own 100 shares of American Express stock. With billions of shares of stock outstanding, American Express is a mighty big company. Your 100 shares represent a tiny piece of it. What do you get for your small slice of American Express? As a stockholder, you share in the company's profits in the form of dividends, quarterly cash payments to shareholders from the company, and an increase, you hope, in the stock price if the company grows and becomes more profitable. Of course, you receive these benefits if things are going well. If American Express's business declines, your stock may be worth less, or even worthless. As the economy grows and companies grow with it and earn greater profits, stock prices and dividend payouts on those stocks generally increase. Stock prices and dividends don't move in lockstep with earnings, but over the years, the relationship is pretty close. In fact, the price-to-earnings ratio, which measures the level of stock prices relative to or divided by company earnings of U.S. stocks, has averaged approximately 15 the past two centuries, although it tends to be higher during periods of low inflation. A price-to-earnings ratio of 15 simply means that shares of a company's stock, on average, are selling at about 15 times the company's earnings per share. When companies go public, they issue shares of stock that people can purchase on the major stock exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange. Companies that issue stock are called publicly held companies. By contrast, some companies are privately held, which means that they've elected to sell their stock only to senior management and a small number of invited, affluent investors. Privately held companies' stocks don't trade on a stock exchange, thus limiting who can be a shareholder. Not only can you invest in company stocks that trade on the U.S. stock exchanges, but you can also invest in stocks overseas. Many investing opportunities exist overseas. If you look at the total value of all stocks outstanding worldwide, the value of U.S. stocks is in the minority. Investing in the stock market involves setbacks and difficult periods, but the overall journey should be worth the effort. Over the past two centuries, the U.S. stock market has produced an annual average rate of return of about 9%, which translates into about 6% per year after subtracting inflation. However, as anyone who has invested in stocks over the years has experienced firsthand, stocks can drop sharply. Worldwide, stocks were sliced approximately in half during the down market that ended in early 2009. So if you can withstand down markets here and there over the course of many years, the stock market is a proven place to invest for long-term growth. Who wouldn't want to own shares in the next hot stock? Few things are more financially satisfying than investing in a stock like Apple or Amazon that multiplies your money many, many times over the years. Investing in individual securities should be done only by those who really enjoy doing it and are aware of and willing to accept the risks in doing so. Researching individual stocks can be more than a full-time job, and if you choose to take this path, remember that you'll be competing against the professionals who do so on a full-time basis. I recommend that you limit your individual stock picking to no more than 20% of your overall investments. Mutual funds, investment pools that hold a collection of securities such as bonds and stocks, span the spectrum of risk and potential returns, from stable value money market funds, which are similar to savings accounts, to bond funds, which generally pay higher yields than money market funds but fluctuate with changes in interest rates, to stock funds, which offer the greatest potential for appreciation but also the greatest short-term volatility. Exchange-traded funds, ETFs, are similar to mutual funds except that they trade on a major stock exchange and, unlike mutual funds, can be bought and sold during the trading day. The best ETFs have low fees, and like an index fund, which invests in a fixed mix of securities that track a specific market index, they invest to track the performance of a stock market index. Efficiently managed mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, if properly selected, are a low-cost way for investors of both modest and substantial means to hire professional money managers. Over the long haul, you're not going to beat full-time professional managers who invest in securities of the same type and risk level. Real estate is another financially rewarding and time-honored ownership investment. Real estate can produce profits when you rent it for more than the expense of owning the property, or you sell it at a price higher than what you paid for it. Over the generations, real estate owners and investors have enjoyed rates of return comparable to those produced by the stock market. 
However, like stocks, real estate goes through good and bad performance periods. Most people who make money investing in real estate do so because they invest over many years and do their homework when they buy to ensure that they purchase good property at an attractive price. The value of real estate depends not only on the particulars of the individual property, but also on the health and performance of the local economy. When companies in the community are growing and more jobs are being produced at higher wages, real estate does well. When local employers are laying people off and excess housing is vacant because of overbuilding, rent and property values fall. Buying your own home is a good place to start investing in real estate. The equity in your home, the difference between the home's market value and the loan you owe on it that builds over the years can become a significant part of your net worth. Over your adult life, owning a home should be less expensive than renting a comparable home. You can invest in homes, duplexes, or small apartment buildings and then rent them out. In the long run, investment property buyers usually see their rental income increase faster than their expenses and the value of their property increase. So successful investment property owners make money monthly and yearly from the cash flow on their properties, as well as when they someday sell their investment property for more than they paid for it. When selecting real estate for investment purposes, remember that local economic growth is the fuel for housing demand. In addition to a vibrant and diverse job base, you want to look for limited supplies of both existing housing and land on which to build. When you identify potential properties in which you may want to invest, run the numbers to understand the cash demands of owning the property and the likely profitability. If you don't want to be a landlord, one of the biggest drawbacks of investment real estate, consider Real Estate Investment Trusts, REITs. REITs are diversified real estate investment companies that purchase and manage rental real estate for investors. A typical REIT invests in different types of property, such as shopping centers, apartments, and other rental buildings. You can invest in REITs either by purchasing them directly on the major stock exchanges or by investing in a real estate mutual fund that invests in numerous REITs. Many folks have also built substantial wealth through small business. You can participate in small business in a variety of ways. You can start your own business, buy and operate an existing business, or simply invest in promising small businesses. Many investors have a simplistic understanding of what risk means and how to apply it to their investment decisions. Having a firm handle on investment risk and what it means to you in your young adult years and as you age is important. For example, when compared to the gyrations of the stock market, a bank savings account may seem like a less risky place to put your money. Over the long term, however, the stock market usually beats the rate of inflation while the interest rate on a savings account does not. Thus, if you're saving your money for a long-term goal like retirement, a savings account can be a riskier place to put your money than a diversified stock portfolio. Before you select a specific investment, first determine your investment needs and goals. Ask yourself, why are you saving money? What are you going to use it for? Establishing objectives is important because the expected use of the money helps you determine which investments to choose. For example, suppose you've been accumulating money for a down payment on a home you want to buy in a few years. You can't afford much risk with that money. You're going to need that money sooner rather than later. Putting that money in the stock market then is foolish because the stock market can drop a lot in a year or over several consecutive years. By contrast, when you're saving toward a longer-term goal that's decades away, such as retirement, you're better able to make riskier investments because your holdings have more time to bounce back from temporary losses or setbacks. You may want to consider investing in growth investments, such as stocks, in a retirement account that you leave alone for many years. Given the relatively higher historic returns for ownership investments like stocks, some people think that they should put all their money in stocks and real estate. So what's the catch? The risk with ownership investments is the short-term drops in their value. During the last century, stocks declined on average by more than 10% once every five calendar years. Drops in stock prices of more than 20% occurred on average once every 10 calendar years. Real estate prices suffer similar periodic setbacks. Therefore, in order to earn those generous long-term returns from ownership investments like stocks and real estate, you must be willing to tolerate volatility. You absolutely should not put all your money in the stock or real estate market. You shouldn't invest your emergency money or money you expect to use within the next five years in such volatile investments. The shorter the time period that you have for holding your money in an investment, 
the less likely growth-oriented investments like stocks are to beat out lending-type investments like bonds. When you invest in stocks and other growth-oriented investments, you must accept the volatility of these investments. That said, you can take several actions to greatly reduce your risk when investing in these higher potential return investments. Invest the money that you have earmarked for the longer term in these vehicles. Minimize the risk of these investments through diversification. Don't buy just one or two stocks. Buy a number of stocks. Diversification is a powerful investment concept. It refers to placing your money in different investments with returns that aren't completely correlated. This is a fancy way of saying that when some of your investments are down in value, odds are that others are up in value. To decrease the chances of all your investments getting clobbered at the same time, put your money in different types of investments, such as bonds, stocks, real estate, and small business. You can further diversify your investments by investing in domestic as well as international markets. Within a given class of investments such as stocks, investing in different types of that class, such as different types of stocks that perform well under various economic conditions, is important. For this reason, mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, which are diversified portfolios of securities such as stocks or bonds, are a highly useful investment vehicle. When you buy into funds, your money is pooled with the money of many others and invested in a vast array of stocks or bonds. Diversification reduces the volatility in the value of your whole portfolio. In other words, your portfolio can achieve the same rate of return that a single investment might typically provide with less fluctuation in value. Keep in mind that no one, no matter whom he works for or what credentials he has, can guarantee returns on an investment. You can do good research and get lucky, but no one is free from the risk of losing money. Diversification allows you to reduce the risk of unnecessarily large losses from your investments. Asset allocation refers to how you spread your investing dollars among different investment options, stocks, bonds, money market accounts, and so on. Over the long term, the asset allocation decision is the most important determinant of total return and risk for a diversified portfolio. Before you can intelligently decide how to allocate your assets, you need to ponder a number of issues, including your present financial situation, your goals and priorities, and the pros and cons of various investment options. Although stocks and real estate offer attractive long-term returns, they can sometimes suffer significant declines. Thus, these investments aren't suitable for money that you think you may want or need to use within, say, the next five years. Money market funds and shorter-term bond investments are good places to keep money that you expect to use soon. Everyone should have a reserve of money, about three to six months' worth of living expenses in a money market fund that he or she can access in an emergency. Shorter-term bonds or bond mutual funds can serve as a higher-yielding, secondary emergency cushion. Investing money for retirement is a classic long-term goal that most people have. Your current age and the number of years until you retire are the biggest factors to consider when allocating money for long-term purposes. The younger you are and the more years you have before retirement, the more comfortable you should be with growth-oriented and more volatile investments, such as stocks and investment real estate. Bonds can also be useful for diversification purposes. For example, when investing for retirement, placing a portion of your money in bonds helps buffer stock market declines. A useful guideline for dividing or allocating your money between longer-term oriented growth investments such as stocks and more conservative lending investments such as bonds is to subtract your age from 110 or 120 if you want to be aggressive, 100 to be more conservative, and invest the resulting percentage in stocks. You then invest the remaining amount in bonds. The allocation of your investment dollars should be driven by your goals and desire to take risk. As you get older, gradually scaling back on the riskiness and therefore growth potential of your portfolio generally makes sense. Don't tinker with your portfolio daily, weekly, monthly, or even annually. Every three to five years or so, you may want to rebalance your holdings to get your mix to a desired asset allocation, as I discuss in the preceding section. Don't trade with the hopes of buying into a hot investment and selling your losers. Jumping onto a winner and dumping a loser may provide some short-term psychological comfort, but in the long term, such an investment strategy often produces subpar returns. Don't let a poor string of events sour you on stock investing. History has repeatedly proven that continuing to buy stocks during down markets increases long-term returns. Throwing in the towel is the worst thing you can do in a slumping market. 
and don't waste time trying to find a way to beat the system. Buy and hold a diversified portfolio of stocks. The financial markets reward investors for accepting risk and uncertainty. Thousands of firms sell investments and manage money. Banks, fund companies, securities brokerage firms, insurance companies, and others all want your money. I recommend that you do business with investment companies that offer the best value investments in comparison to their competitors. Value is the combination of performance, including service, and cost. Commissions, management fees, maintenance fees, and other charges can turn a high-performance investment into a mediocre or poor one. Employ representatives who don't have an inherent self-interest in steering you into a particular type of investment. Give preference to investing firms that don't tempt their employees to push one investment over another in order to generate more fees. If the investment firm's people are paid on commission, be careful. Funds are an ideal investment vehicle for most investors. No-load fund companies are firms through which you can invest in funds without paying sales commissions, so all your invested dollars go to work in the mutual funds you choose. Discount brokers generally pay the salaries of their brokers. Discount brokers are simply brokers without major conflicts of interest. Of course, like any other for-profit enterprise, they're in business to make money, but they're much less likely to steer you wrong for their own benefit. Believing that you can increase your investment returns by following the prognostication of certain gurus is a common mistake that some investors make, especially during more trying and uncertain times. Many people want to believe that some experts can predict the future of the investment world and keep them out of harm's way. Ignore the predictions and speculations of self-proclaimed gurus and investment soothsayers. Commentators and experts who publish predictive commentaries and newsletters and who are invested in the media can't predict the future. The few people who have a slight leg up on everyone else aren't going to share their investment secrets. They're too busy investing their own money. If you have to believe in something to offset your fears, believe in good information and proven investment managers. Before you cast your investment line, consider the following two often overlooked ways to put your money to work and earn higher returns without much risk. Pay off high interest debt. If, for example, you have credit card debt outstanding at 14% interest, paying off that loan is the same as putting your money to work in an investment with a sure 14% annual return. Remember that the interest on consumer debt isn't tax deductible, so you would actually need to earn more than 14% investing your money elsewhere in order to net 14% after paying taxes. Fund retirement accounts. If you work for a company that offers a retirement savings plan such as a 401k, fund it at the highest level you can manage. If you earn self-employment income, consider an SEP IRA plan. Keep money for shorter-term goals like buying a car or a home in separate, much more liquid accounts. When you invest money outside a retirement account, those investments are exposed to taxation. Therefore, you must understand the tax features of your situation and your investment choices. To decide between comparable taxable and tax-free investments, you need to know your marginal tax bracket, the tax rate you pay on an extra dollar of taxable income, and each investment's interest rate or yield. When you have a few thousand dollars or less, your simplest path is to keep this money in a local bank or credit union. Look first to the institution where you keep your checking account. Keeping this stash of money in your checking account rather than in a separate savings account makes financial sense if the extra money helps you avoid monthly service charges when your checking account balance would otherwise dip below the minimum. Compare the service charges on your checking account with the potential interest earnings from a savings account. Another option to consider is putting your money into a money market fund, a type of mutual fund, the best of which are usually superior to bank savings accounts because they pay higher yields than bank savings accounts and allow check writing. And if you're in a high tax bracket, you can select a tax-free money market fund which pays interest that's free from federal and or state tax, something you can't get with a bank savings account. The yield on a money market fund is an important consideration. The operating expenses deducted before payment of dividends are generally the single biggest determinant of yield. All other things being equal, lower operating expenses translate into higher yields for you. 
with interest rates as low as they have been in recent years, seeking out money funds with the lowest operating expenses is essential. Doing most or all of your fund shopping, money market and otherwise, at one good fund company can reduce the clutter in your investing life. Chasing after a slightly higher yield offered by another company is sometimes not worth the extra paperwork and administrative hassle. On the other hand, there's no reason why you can't invest in funds at multiple firms, as long as you don't mind the extra accounts, using each for its relative strengths. You can buy funds from different fund companies in a single brokerage account. If you plan to invest outside retirement accounts, asset allocation for these accounts should depend on how comfortable you are with risk and how much time you have until you plan to use the money. That's not because you won't be able to sell these investments on short notice if necessary. Investing money in a more volatile investment is simply riskier if you need to liquidate it in the short term. Short-Term Investments These investments are suitable for saving money for a home or some other major purchase within a few years. When investing for the short term, look for liquidity and stability, features that rule out real estate and stocks. Recommended investments include shorter-term bond funds, which are higher-yielding alternatives to money market funds. If interest rates increase, these funds will likely drop in value, but relatively less than longer-term bond funds. Intermediate-term investments. These investments are appropriate for more than a few years, but less than 10 years. Investments that fit the bill are intermediate-term bonds and well-diversified, balanced funds, which include some stocks as well as bonds. Long-Term Investments If you have a decade or more for investing your money, you can consider a portfolio that's balanced between bonds and potentially higher return and therefore riskier investments. Stocks, real estate, and other growth-oriented investments can earn the most money if you're comfortable with the risk involved. Bank CDs are popular with generally older, safety-minded investors with some extra cash that they don't need in the near future, typically a year or two. With a CD, you get a higher rate of return than you get on a bank's savings account, and unlike with bond and stock funds, your principal doesn't fluctuate in value. Compared to bonds, however, CDs have a couple of drawbacks. Inaccessibility In a CD, your money isn't accessible unless you pay a penalty, typically six months' interest, with a no-load, commission-free bond fund, you can access your money without penalty whenever you need it. Taxability Interest from CDs is taxable. Bonds, on the other hand, come in tax-free, federal and or state, and taxable flavors, so bonds offer higher tax bracket investors a tax-friendly option that CDs can't match. In the long run, you should earn more, perhaps 1-2% to 2 more per year, and have better access to your money in bond funds than in CDs. Bond funds make particular sense when you're in a higher tax bracket, and you'd benefit from tax-free income on your investments by investing in municipal bond funds. If you're not in a high tax bracket, and you have a bad day whenever your bond fund takes a dip in value, consider CDs. Just make sure you shop around to get the best interest rate. Stocks have stood the test of time for building wealth. Remember that when you invest in stocks in taxable, non-retirement accounts, all the distributions on those stocks, such as dividends and capital gains, are taxable. Stock dividends and long-term capital gains do benefit from lower tax rates, maximum of 23.8%, but this may decrease under future possible congressional action. Some stock-picking advocates argue that you should shun stock funds because of tax considerations. I disagree. You can avoid stock funds that generate a lot of short-term capital gains, which are taxed at the relatively high ordinary income tax rates. Index funds, which invest in a fixed mix of stocks to track a particular market index, are tax efficient. Additionally, some fund companies offer tax-friendly stock funds, which are appropriate if you don't want current income or you're in a high federal tax bracket and seek to minimize receiving taxable distributions on your funds. Annuities are accounts that are partly insurance, but mostly investment. Consider contributing to an annuity only after you exhaust contributions to all your available retirement accounts. Because annuities carry higher annual operating expenses than comparable mutual funds, you should consider them only if you plan to leave your money invested, preferably for 15 years or more. Even if you leave your money invested for that long, tax-friendly funds can allow your money to grow without excessive annual taxation. 
If you're in your young adult years, the good news is that you likely have decades to grow your nest egg before you need to draw on the bulk of your retirement account assets. The more years you have before you're going to retire, the greater your ability to take risk. As long as the value of your investments has time to recover, what's the big deal if some of your investments drop a bit over a year or two? Of course, you should be concerned with growing your portfolio enough to keep you ahead of the inevitable inflation that occurs over the years. Think of your retirement accounts as part of your overall plan to generate retirement income. Then, allocate different types of investments between your tax-advantaged retirement accounts and other taxable investment accounts to get the maximum benefit of tax deferral. When you have access to various retirement accounts, prioritize which account you're going to use first by determining how much each gives you in return. You should focus your contributions in this order. 1. First, fund employer-based plans that match your contributions. 2. Next, contribute to any other employer or self-employed plans that allow tax-deductible contributions. 3. After you contribute as much as possible to these tax-deductible plans, or if you don't have access to such plans, contribute to an IRA. 4. If you max out on contributions to an IRA or exceed the income limitations for an IRA contribution, consider a Roth 401k, employer offered after tax contributions, and then an annuity. Investments and account types are different issues. People sometimes get confused when discussing the investments they make in retirement accounts, especially people who have a retirement account, such as an IRA, at a bank. They don't realize that you can have your IRA at a variety of financial institutions, for example, a mutual fund company or brokerage firm. At each financial institution, you can choose among the firm's investment options for investing your IRA money. No-load or commission-free mutual fund and discount brokerage firms are your best bets for establishing a retirement account. In some company-sponsored plans, such as 401ks, you're limited to a short list of investment choices. I discuss typical investment options for 401k plans in order of increasing risk and hence likely return. Money Market Folks who are skittish about the stock and bond markets are attracted to money market and savings accounts because they haven't dropped in value. In the long run, you won't be doing yourself any favors. Trying to time your investments to attempt to catch the lows and avoid the peaks is impossible. Bond Mutual Funds Bond funds invest in a mixture of typically high-quality bonds. Bonds pay a higher yield than money funds. Depending on whether your plan's option is a short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term fund, maybe you have more than one type, the bond fund's current yield is probably a percent or two higher than the money market fund's yield. Bond funds carry higher yields than money market funds, but they also carry greater risk because their value can fall if interest rates increase. However, bonds tend to be more stable in value over the shorter term, such as a few years, than stocks. Aggressive, younger investors should keep a minimum amount of money in bond funds. Guaranteed Investment Contracts, GICs, also known as Stable Value Funds. Guaranteed investment contracts are backed by an insurance company, and they typically quote you an interest rate a year in advance. The attraction of these investments is that your account value doesn't fluctuate, at least not that you can see. In GICs, you pay for the peace of mind of a guaranteed return with lower than bond fund long-term returns, and GICs have another minor drawback. Insurance companies, unlike mutual funds, can and do fail putting GIC investment dollars at risk. Some retirement plans have been burned by insurer failures. Balanced Mutual Funds Balanced funds invest primarily in a mixture of stocks and bonds. This one-stop shopping concept offers broad diversification, makes investing easier, and smooths out fluctuations in the value of your investments. Funds investing exclusively in stocks or in bonds make for a rougher ride. Stock Funds Stock funds invest in stocks, which often provide greater long-term growth potential, but also wider fluctuations in value from year to year. Some companies offer a number of different stock funds, including funds that invest overseas. Unless you plan to borrow against your funds to purchase a home, if your plan allows, you should have plenty of stock funds. Stock in your employer some companies offer employees the option of investing in the company's stock. I generally suggest avoiding this option because your future income and other employee benefits are already riding on the company's success. If the company hits the skids, you may lose your job and your benefits. 
you certainly don't want the value of your retirement account to depend on the same factors. If you think strongly that your company has its act together and the stock is a good buy, investing a portion of your retirement account is fine, but no more than 25%. Some employers offer employees an option to buy company stock outside a tax-deferred retirement plan at a discount, sometimes as much as 15% to its current market value. If your company offers a discount on its stock, consider taking advantage of it. When you sell the stock, you're usually able to lock in a profit over your purchase price. With self-employed plans, for example, SEP IRAs, certain 403b plans for nonprofit employees and IRAs, you may select the investment options as well as the allocation of money among them. To establish your retirement account at one of these firms, call the company's toll-free number and ask the representative to send you an account application for the type of account, for example, SEP IRA, 403b, and so on, you want to set up. Most investment firms provide downloadable account applications, and they may allow you to complete the application online. A discount brokerage account can allow you centralized, one-stop shopping and the ability to hold mutual funds from a variety of leading fund companies. Some funds are available without transaction fees, although you pay a small transaction fee to buy most of the better funds. The reason? The discounter is a middleman between you and the fund companies. Whether you're about to begin a regular college investment plan or you've already started saving, your emotions may lead you astray. The hype about educational costs may scare you into taking a financially detrimental path. Quality education for your children or continued education for yourself doesn't have to and probably won't cost you as much as gargantuan projections suggest. Just as your child shouldn't choose a college based solely on whether he thinks he can get in, he shouldn't choose a college on the basis of whether you think you can afford it. Except for the affluent, who can pay for the full cost of college, everyone else should apply for financial aid. Some parents who don't think they qualify for financial aid are pleasantly surprised to find that their children have access to loans as well as grants, which don't have to be repaid. Under the current financial needs analysis, the value of your retirement plans isn't considered an asset. By contrast, money that you save outside retirement accounts, especially money in the child's name, is counted as an asset and reduces your eligibility for financial aid. Fund your retirement accounts, such as 401ks and SEP IRAs, before saving for your child's education. In addition to getting an immediate tax deduction on your contributions, your earnings grow without taxation while you're maximizing your child's chances of qualifying for aid. Foregoing contributions to your retirement savings plans to save in a taxable account for your kid's college fund is foolish because you'll be expected to contribute more to your child's educational costs. Although you may not have children yet, or your children may be young, you've probably started thinking about how you're going to pay for their college expenses. College can cost a lot. The total costs, including tuition, fees, books, supplies, room, board, and transportation, vary substantially from school to school. The total average annual cost is running around $50,000 per year at private colleges and around $25,000 in-state rate at public colleges. Figuring out how you're going to pay these expenses can be overwhelming. You first want to put as much money as possible in your retirement accounts. If you have money left over after taking advantage of retirement accounts, try to save for your children's college costs. Save in your name unless you know you aren't going to apply for financial aid, including those loans that are available regardless of your economic situation. Be realistic about what you can afford for college expenses given your other financial goals. Being able to personally pay 100% of the cost of a college education, especially at a four-year private college, is a luxury of the affluent. If you're not a high-income earner, consider trying to save enough to pay a third, or at most, half of the cost. You can make up the balance through a wide variety of means, such as the following. Loans. A host of financial aid programs, including a number of loan programs, allow you to borrow at reasonable interest rates. Federal government educational loans have variable interest rates, which means that the interest rate you're charged floats, or varies, with the overall level of interest rates. The rates are also capped, so the rate can never exceed several percent more than the initial rate on the loan. Grants. In addition to loans, a number of grant programs are available through schools, the government, and independent sources. You can apply for federal government grants via the FAFSA. Grants available through state government programs may require a separate application. 
Specific colleges and other private organizations, for example, employers, banks, credit unions, and community groups, also offer grants and scholarships. Your home's equity. If you're a homeowner, you may be able to borrow against the equity, market value less the outstanding mortgage loan, in your property. This option is useful because you can borrow against your home at a reasonable interest rate, and the interest is generally tax-deductible. Some company retirement plans, such as 401ks, allow borrowing as well. IRAs Parents may make penalty-free withdrawals from individual retirement accounts if the funds are used for college expenses. Although you won't be charged an early withdrawal penalty, the IRS and most states will treat the amount withdrawn as taxable income. On top of that, the financial aid office will look at your beefed-up income and assume that you don't need as much financial aid. You can make qualified withdrawals from Roth IRAs and not be taxed. Your child's employment Your child can work during the summer and save that money for educational expenses. Besides giving your child a stake in his own future, this training encourages sound personal financial management. When figuring out where you want to protect your hard-earned money, you have several choices. You want to select an institution that offers the services you need on attractive terms. The most obvious choice for banking is using a local bank you pass by on a regular basis. Although these types of banks are conveniently located, these banks may not be the most cost-efficient. You can find two main types of brick-and-mortar banks. Small Town Bank These banks only have a handful of branches. Some of the tellers may even remember your name and face. Hours are generally limited, and you may face extra ATM fees for using ATMs that aren't at one of the bank's branches. Big Banks Such banks tend to be regional, national, and sometimes even multinational. You may recognize their name from extensive advertising campaigns. They tend to have extensive ATM networks, which may reduce your ATM fees, but you pay for it in other ways, such as through less competitive terms, interest rate paid, service fees levied, on checking and savings accounts. Be sure to comparison shop among several banks and scrutinize their fees and interest rates on their checking accounts and any other type of account you may be interested in. Online Banks Although traditional banks with walk-in branch locations are shrinking in numbers because of closures, consolidations, and some failures, online banking is growing, and for good reason. One of the biggest expenses of operating a traditional retail bank is the cost of the real estate and the related costs of the branch. Online banks generally don't have any or many retail branches and conduct their business mostly over the internet and through the mail. By lowering their costs of doing business, the best online banks may offer better account terms, such as paying you higher interest rates on your account balances. Online banks can also offer better terms on loans. Online banking is convenient, too. You can conduct most transactions more quickly on the Internet, and by banking online, you save the bank money, which enables the bank to offer you better account terms. And because online banking is generally available 24-7, you don't need to rush out at lunchtime to make it to your bank during its limited open hours. Note, traditional brick-and-mortar banks now generally offer many online services. You can also place your money in a brokerage account or money market fund. No matter what type of bank you choose, make sure you have a firm grasp of the different account options. Doing so requires thinking about your banking needs and what's important to you and what's not. Transaction Accounts Whether it's paying monthly bills or having something in your wallet to make purchases with at retail stores, Everyone needs the ability to conduct transactions. Two of the most common types of transaction accounts are checking accounts and credit cards. Checking accounts The most fundamental of bank accounts, a checking account enables you to pay bills by check or electronic payments and deposit money from your job, including through direct deposit. Interest paid is generally low or non-existent, and you need to watch out for various fees. During periods of low interest rates, the fees levied on a transaction account, such as a checking account, should be of greater concern to you than the interest paid on account balances. After all, you shouldn't be keeping lots of extra cash in a checking account. You have better options for that. Debit cards are excellent transaction cards. They connect to your checking account, thus eliminating the need for you to carry around excess cash. 
They carry a Visa or MasterCard logo and are widely accepted by merchants for purchases and for obtaining cash from your checking account. Unlike a credit card, debit cards have no credit feature, so you can't spend money that you don't have. Because of bank regulations, bank customers must give their permission or consent in advance for overdraft protection and the associated fee from a debit card transaction. Check and electronic bill payments go through as they always have and can lead to an account being overdrawn. However, you can rack up overdraft fees if your bank processes debit card transactions that lead to your account being overdrawn. Credit cards These transaction cards, which are offered by banks with either the Visa or MasterCard logo, enable you to make purchases and pay for them over time if you so choose. Discover and American Express also offer their own credit cards. I'm not a fan of credit cards because the credit feature enables you to spend money you don't have and carry a debt balance from month to month. Notwithstanding the lower short-term interest rates some cards charge to lure new customers, the reality is that borrowing on credit cards is expensive, usually to the tune of about 16%. The smart way to use such a card is to pay the bill in full each month and avoid these high interest charges. You need a firm understanding of the different features of the transaction accounts your bank offers so you can easily access your cash. You may think choosing a bank that has a large ATM network is your best option, but think again. Remember, one reason that bank customers have gotten lousy terms on their accounts is that they gravitate toward larger banks and their extensive ATM networks so they can easily get cash when they need it. These ATM networks, and the often associated bank branches, are costly for banks to maintain, so you pay higher fees and get lower yields when you're the customer of a bank with a large ATM network, especially a bank that does tons of advertising. Do you really need to carry a lot of cash and have access to a large ATM network? Probably not. A debit card is likely the better option for most people since these cards are so widely accepted by retailers and other product and service sellers. Savings Accounts Savings accounts are accounts for holding spare cash in order to earn some interest. Banks and credit unions generally pay higher interest rates on savings account balances than they do on checking account balances. But savings account interest rates have often lagged behind the rates of the best money market funds offered by mutual fund companies and brokerage firms. Online banking is changing that dynamic, however, and now the best banks and credit unions offer competitive rates on savings accounts. The virtue of most savings accounts is that you can earn some interest yet have penalty-free access to your money. The investment doesn't fluctuate in value the way a bond does, and you don't have early withdrawal penalties as you do with a Certificate of Deposit, CD. No matter whether you choose a brick-and-mortar bank or an online bank, technology has allowed people to do more and more of their banking on the Internet. With this benefit come some important points to remember to protect yourself and your dinero. When searching for a bank that fits your needs, put on your detective hat and get ready to search for the best deals. You don't want to pick a bank just because that's where your parents or a co-worker bank. Some online banks are able to offer higher interest rates because they're based overseas and therefore don't participate in the FDIC program. Banks must pay insurance premiums into the FDIC fund, which of course adds to a bank's costs. Another risk for you is non-covered banks that take excessive risks with their business to be able to pay depositors higher interest rates. When considering doing business with an online bank or a smaller bank you haven't heard of, you should be especially careful to ensure that the bank is covered under the FDIC. And don't simply accept the bank's word for it or the bank's display of the FDIC logo in its offices or on its website. In addition to ensuring that a bank is covered by the FDIC, also seek answers to these questions. What's the bank's reputation for its services? This may not be easy to discern, but at a minimum, you should conduct an internet search of the bank's name along with the word complaints or problems and examine the results. How accessible and knowledgeable are customer service people at the bank? You want to be able to talk to a live, helpful person when you need help. Look for a phone number on the bank's website and call it to see how difficult reaching a live person is. Ask the customer service representatives questions to determine how knowledgeable and service-oriented they are. What are the process and options for withdrawing your money? This issue is important to discuss with the bank's customer service people because you want convenient, low-cost access to your money. For example, if a bank lacks ATMs, what does it charge you for using other ATMs? 
What are the fees for particular services? You can probably find this information on the bank's website in a section called Account Terms or Disclosures. Also, look for the Truth in Savings Disclosure, which answers relevant account questions in a standardized format. The attractions of banking online are pretty obvious. For starters, banking on your computer whenever you want can be enormously convenient. You don't have to race around during your lunch break to find a local bank branch. And thanks to their lower overhead, the best online banks are generally able to offer competitive interest rates and account terms to their customers. Even if you go with a brick-and-mortar bank, you can usually also bank online. You probably know from experience that conducting any type of transaction online is safe as long as you use some common sense and know who you're doing business with before you go forward. That said, others who have gone before you have gotten ripped off, so you do need to protect yourself. IC3 and other online security experts recommend that you take the following steps to protect yourself and your identity when conducting business online. Never access your bank accounts from a shared computer or on a shared network, such as the free access networks offered in hotel rooms and in other public or business facilities. Make certain that your computer has antivirus and firewall software that's periodically updated to keep up with the latest threats. Be aware of missed statements that could indicate your account has been taken over. Report unauthorized transactions to your bank or credit card company as soon as possible, otherwise your bank may not stand behind the loss of funds. Use a complicated and unique password, including both letters and numbers, for your online bank account. Be careful about the sites you visit. Sites purporting to offer free access music, games, and movies are often sources of viruses and trojans that fraudsters use to steal your account information. Watch out for fishers, people posing to be your bank or bank's representative. If they are contacting you, especially through email, it's likely to be fraud. Never follow a bank link directly from an email. Always visit the bank website directly by typing in the URL. Log out immediately after completing your transactions on financial websites. Other financial companies have cost advantages similar to, and in some cases even better than, those of banks, which translates into better deals for you. Brokerage firms enable you to buy and sell stocks, bonds, and other securities. Charles Schwab, Scott Trade, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, and Fidelity are among the larger brokerage firms or investment companies with substantial brokerage operations you may have read or heard about. Some of these firms have fairly extensive branch office networks, and others don't. But those that have a reasonable number of branch offices have been able to keep a competitive position because of their extensive customer and asset base, and because they aren't burdened by banking regulations, because they aren't banks, and the costs associated with operating as a bank. Remember, a type of account worth checking out at brokerage firms is an asset management account, also referred to as a cash management account. Although the best deals on such accounts at some firms are only available to higher balance investors, the best of these accounts typically enable you to hold and invest in various investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and so on, in a single account. Write checks against a money market balance that pays competitive yields. Use a Visa or MasterCard debit card for transactions. Money Market Funds Basically, a money market fund is very similar to a bank savings account, except that mutual fund companies offer them, which means they lack FDIC coverage. Historically, this hasn't been a problem, because retail money funds have lost shareholder principal only in one case, the reserve primary fund lost less than 1% of investors' money. The attraction of money market funds is that the best ones pay higher yields than bank savings accounts and also come in tax-free versions, which is good for higher tax bracket investors.